Hello and welcome to this second session of our summer learning at St. Paul Lutheran Church in the summer of 2020. I am Peter Pettit, the teaching pastor at St. Paul, and we're focused this summer on what to do with a bestseller. The Bible, of course, is that bestseller. In our first session, we took a look at devotional reading of the Bible as one of the things that we can do with it. In this second session, we'll take a look more at how we turn to the Bible for guidance. When we do turn to the Bible for guidance, we are really directed there, and this whole reading grows out of the circumstances, the situations in which we find ourselves. Uh, the challenges that we face in life, the kinds of decisions that we need to make, uh, whether that be about our education, or perhaps about our career, about our relationships, um, maybe about our community and its direction or our participation in it, perhaps about our spiritual life. There are all sorts of questions that we face on a day-to-day -day basis, and we may turn to the Bible for guidance in making judgments about what's better and what's worse, what values to embrace and what to avoid. Now, to be honest with you, and I would always wanna be honest with you, I have to say that I don't find this to be a particularly easy use of the Bible in my own experience. The Bible, after all, comes to us from very different times and places than the ones in which we live. And so it's not easy to find directly applicable guidance or counsel for how we should deal with the issues in our own day. The cultural different distance between the Bible's writers and their communities and our times and our communities is just so great that it takes a lot of understanding, perhaps we might say a lot of translation. Um, frankly, it takes a lot of work to be able to find guidance that we, about which we can feel confident in the Bible for the situations and circumstances that we face today much more than looking for specific answers to specific questions, it can be useful to look at what are the values that are broadly affirmed within Scripture over and over again? What are the principles that we can discern within scriptural stories, narratives, not just the wisdom-like advice that comes in a book like Proverbs, but how do biblical characters behave and let's remember that often they behave badly. And the point of the story is that God reaches out with forgiveness and re-embraces them, and continues to embrace them and offer them an opportunity for repentance and reform. So just because God takes a Joseph who gets sold by his brothers down into slavery in Egypt and makes him the grand vizier of Egypt who, through a famine, can rescue his family and save them for future generations, this doesn't suggest that we ought to sell our little brothers into slavery to another country. Um, my own, one of my own mentors, Jim Sanders, uses that as a favorite example of how the Bible's characters are not always exemplars of moral behavior. Sometimes the story is about what God does with us when we're the farthest thing from good moral examples. And yet there are ways in which we can look for these patterns, look for these principles, look for these values in Scripture so that they form us in a way that even if the Bible doesn't have a specific piece of advice for us, we can say, that we respond to our challenges out of a biblical awareness, a kind of formation that is biblical within us. Even when we look for the values and the patterns, that can present us with challenges because of the gaps between the Bible's world and ours. So for example, 
the Bible talks a lot about kings and knows nothing about nation states. The political organization of the ancient world was quite different from the political organization that we see in our contemporary world. The Bible talks about marriage and shows us, frankly, that the ancient ancestors of biblical Israel and of us as Christians um, were, frankly, polygamists. They had more than one wife. Uh, Abraham had Sarah, his wife, and he had children by Hagar, his concubine. And the Bible seems to have no problem with that as a moral issue. Um, so the relationships and the, the way in which um, society is organized is quite different. Um, it's a deeply patriarchal society that we see uh, with, with no real challenge to that uh, explicitly within the scripture. Now, all of that needs to be taken into account as we would look to the Bible for guidance. Same is true for patterns of labor. Um, it was common for someone to indenture themselves to someone else for a time in order to pay off a debt. Uh, we don't often look at indentured servitude as a viable or a morally upright option uh, these days, let alone the outright slavery that the Bible at times uh, not only recognizes as present, but even can condone. Um, so in all these ways, uh, we have to be aware as we turn to the Bible for guidance um, that, that there are great differences between that world and ours and figuring out how to make that transition from that world to ours uh, is really a lifelong practice. It's a lifelong challenge for us, um, but, but not without some helps. So, the more we know, and the better that we understand that world, the better we can apply its values and principles to our own lives. Now, that's not to say that there aren't specific questions we can put to scripture and perhaps get some responses. One of the resources that I suggest uh, that we become familiar with is a, a good concordance. A concordance is a book which has the vocabulary of the Bible, the words of the biblical text, organized alphabetically. So that, for example, if you want to know all the places in scripture where the word wealth occurs, um, if you go to an unabridged concordance, you will find all of those places. And the one that I use for the New Revised Standard Version says there are 115 places in scripture where the word wealth occurs. And that, that doesn't count the places where it's wealthy or wealthier. Um, it's just the word wealth 115 times. That's a lot to look through. And as you may imagine, in, for example, the story of biblical Israel, most often that reference is to the wealth of an individual. Um, may or may not be of much interest or help to us in asking the question, how do I handle wealth? What do I do with wealth? But as we get to know our scripture, uh, we can understand that there are certain places where wealth might be talked about in the kind of moral terms that could help to guide us. So for example, in the opening chapters of Deuteronomy, um, one of the things that uh, Moses says to the people of Israel and it's in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Um, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, don't say, my own hand and my own wits have gotten me this wealth, but rather recognize that that wealth which you have is a gift from God, and therefore there is a devotion to God, there is a, an allegiance to God, there's a faithfulness to God, which this gift from God calls forth from you. Um, similarly, we might look in Proverbs and find in chapter 13 that wealth hastily gotten will dwindle. Um, that wealth is, true wealth is not something that's a windfall that we get. Um, one could tell stories about all those who win the lottery and uh, look at them five and ten years later. Um, how has that wealth 
into which they fell or which fell upon them? Uh, how has that fared over five or 10 years? Wealth gotten hastily will dwindle, says Proverbs chapter 13. Um, that may or may not apply to our situation. What was the, they didn't have lotteries in biblical Israel, um, so what was wealth gotten hastily for them? We should want to investigate that before we apply this saying to our own lives. At the same time, there are some things that are pretty clear. Um, when we turn to Matthew and the New Testament, there are two occurrences of the word wealth in Matthew. Uh, the first one in chapter 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount, you cannot serve God and wealth. That's in the New Revised Standard Version. You may know it more familiarly from the Revised Standard or the King James Version. You cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, that principle about wealth uh, would seem to be pretty universally applicable, that one can have only one God. And that's not to say that wealth makes it impossible to worship God, but the worship of wealth makes it impossible to worship God because our hearts can only be fixed on one thing, says Matthew in his gospel. And the other occurrence uh, in Matthew chapter 13 in the parable of the sower, where you know the, the seed is scattered on four different kinds of land, and, and the one that falls among weeds sprouts up and begins to grow, but quickly, the parable says, the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke it off so that the good seed of the gospel, the good seed of, of a life of faithfulness lived in God is, uh, is killed. Um, by those weeds that are the cares of the world and the lure of wealth. So a concordance can be helpful. Um, with 115 references to wealth, it takes a little bit of sorting out to find them, um, but that's where another resource can be useful. Uh, in the exhibit, which is uh, provided along with this course, uh, there are two books published by the Thomas Nelson Publishers, um, one is called Find It Fast in the Bible, and the other is Where to Find It in the Bible. Find It Fast recognizes that uh, it can be difficult to find, for example, the phrase, the name of God. Um, how many times does name appear in the Bible? Uh, if you look it up in a regular concordance, all you can do is look for the word name. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, and the word God, oh my gosh. You know, thousands of times in the Bible. So what Find It Fast does is to recognize that there are these phrases for which people might be searching. And so they tell us that there are several dozen places where name of God appears as a phrase. And then it's easier to do that search for that specific phrase rather than having to correlate the two different searches through hundreds or thousands of references. Um, where to find it in the Bible is a bit broader than that. It doesn't focus on the vocabulary, even at the phrase level, but rather it's topical. So an example that I give in the exhibit, the word maturity actually only occurs four times in the Bible, and only once does it mean anything other than full grown, like an animal grows to maturity. Um, but if we want to investigate maturity as a topic, then there are a number of places where one can explore that, uh, but they don't actually use the word mature or maturity. And so we wouldn't find them looking in a concordance. But where to find it in the Bible, this reference work by Thomas Nelson Publishers and Ken Anderson, the editor of it, um, helps us to find places where not the word, but the topic of maturity is found. It's another useful reference. Now, in general, one also learns over time that there are certain places within Scripture where guidance is more likely to be found. 
So in talking about wealth, we said, you know, in the history of biblical Israel, wealth was most likely to refer just to someone who was wealthy or had wealth or used their wealth in a certain way. Um, but in the wisdom literature of Proverbs or in Jesus' teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, um, we're more likely to find something that helps us learn about how to handle wealth. And so generally, um, one, for example, if we want to learn about justice, uh, the prophets of biblical Israel are an excellent place to go. If we want to learn about community and how the community of God's people lives well together, uh, Paul's letters to the Corinthians, a troubled community to be sure, uh, Paul, and so Paul's letters to the Corinthians offer us a perspective, Paul's perspective, on how one lives well in community. Um, if we're interested in leadership as a topic, Paul's letters to Timothy, who was a leader in the early church, and Paul, or one of his, uh, uh, someone in Paul's school, wrote to Timothy with good counsel about how to lead in a community. Now, this is one of those places where the writer of First Timothy says, I don't believe, or I teach, that women should be silent in church. All right, that's probably not something that we're going to translate directly into our situation, but it does say something, and the more we know about that context, the, the clearer it is that it, it, it can teach us something about a principle of good order within church. And in fact, within most churches, uh, it's not everybody who can get up and speak at any time they feel like it. Um, there is a process of ordination. There's a process of training for those who would lead worship as the principal leaders, even for those who would read scripture or offer prayers. Often a congregation will, will provide a measure of orientation or training that they expect people to take part in. Um, so while they don't say women can't do that, um, they would say, if you haven't been through our training, it's better not to do that. And in a sense, they're following the advice, the guidance of 1 Timothy, which says, set your standards. Know what it is that you expect in your community and apply them fairly. We've learned that excluding women is not fair, but we don't think that asking for a certain amount of training is unfair. So we're working with a different specific standard, but still working with the same principle. Um, general wisdom about life can be found, for example, in the book of Proverbs or even in Ecclesiastes. Um, and if we want to know about living in the kingdom, well, there are a few better places to turn to it than Jesus' teachings, either in his parables or an example I'd like to use the Sermon on the Mount, and specifically the Beatitudes. Now, this is a case where we really have to spend some time with the text and dig into it a little bit in order to understand what this guidance is. But you know the Beatitudes in all likelihood. You've heard them. They're fairly familiar. They get quoted in part probably every week by somebody in the public. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, but they will be called children of God. Now, if you take a look at this text, Matthew 5, verses 3 through 10, one of the things that we can see is that the first four of these describe conditions of an individual. Poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Those can characterize me. I can be very low and in bad spirits, poor in spirit. I can be mourning. I can feel totally inadequate and meek. 
I can be hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for the right things to be present in the world. And the other four describe what a person does or how a person is treated. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart who act with pure motives. Blessed are the peacemakers. And finally, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Four and four seems to me one of the ways we can work with those is to line up the two fours and why can't I get this line straight? Line up the two fours so that we see that even if you're poor in spirit and feeling terrible, you can be merciful. Even if you are mourning in deep sadness you can remain pure in heart, telling the truth, acting from pure motives, not out of the resentment or the bitterness of your mourning. Even if you are meek and don't feel very powerful at all, you can be a peacemaker, bringing whatever you have to the cause of peace. And if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, don't give up on that. Because even if people laugh at you, if they make fun of you, if they per take advantage of you, if they persecute you for righteousness, sake, Jesus says you will be filled and you will have the kingdom of heaven. You wouldn't think that the Beatitudes are necessarily a place to find guidance, but as we look at the text more closely, whatever your condition, there is a way you can live that keeps you aligned with God and God's purposes for the world. That's pretty good guidance. That's an example of a deeper read that we can give to Scripture as we become more and more familiar with it. And this is where the wider context comes in for this week's topic of seeking guidance in the Bible. The wider context is to move beyond our own culture and worldview and to really dig into what was the culture, what were the circumstances in Scripture. And there are a couple of reference resources that you can use um, to do that. One is a good one-volume commentary, which in pretty short order will give you the kind of background that can help to understand a, uh, a reference, uh, a picture, an image in Scripture with which you're not particularly familiar. And the other is a Bible dictionary. Again, um, look it up. If you go to the uh, Grow in Faith uh, section of the exhibit, you will find both a one-volume commentary and a Bible dictionary there uh, with examples of how they can help us to get a wider horizon on the word study that we might try in seeking guidance uh, so that we can take Scripture's uh, principles, values, um, and, and apply them effectively, meaningfully, responsibly, in our own lives. You know, ultimately, the best guidance that the Bible gives any of us is read me the Bible broadly and deeply, broadly and frequently. Because in doing that, we get formed by the Bible, and everything we do is then guided by it. As Paul says, quoting that hymn that is uh, in Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. Christ is the Word. Scripture is our primary witness to that Word. And as we know it better, then more and more we have this mind 
among ourselves, which is in the Word. Thanks much for your involvement this week and for your involvement this summer. I very much look forward to the conversations we can have about this. God bless.